Hello, my name is Jürgen Knoblich. I'm a scientist at the Institute of Molecular Biotechnology of the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna. And today, I would like to tell you about asymmetric cell division, one of the most fundamental processes in developmental biology. My lab is interested in the development of the human brain, one of the most complex but also fascinating structures that nature has generated. And on this slide, I've summarized what we know about the development of mammalian brains. The mammalian cortex develops from a neuroepithelium that lines a liquid-filled cavity, which is called the lateral ventricle. It's a polarized epithelium where basal is on the outside and apical is on the inside. And it's a very nice model system to study because all the different cell types are nicely arranged along the apical basal axis of the epithelium in a layer type fashion. So here on the more basal side is the so-called cortical plate. And this is where the neurons reside and where they send out their axons. Here on the more apical side is the so-called ventricular zone. And this is where the stem and progenitor cells reside. And these progenitor cells can undergo either one of three different types of division. So early during the development, they divide symmetrically. And this leads to an initial amplification of the progenitor pool. And later, they start to divide asymmetrically so that one progenitor generates one progenitor cell and one cell that migrates out into the cortical plate to undergo terminal neuronal differentiation. Or alternatively, the second cell can be a so-called intermediate progenitor, which divides once more into two terminally differentiating neurons. And this is called direct or indirect neurogenesis. Now, asymmetric cell division is a conserved process that happens during the development of many brains. So this is an, the development of an insect brain, in this case, the fruit fly, Drosophila. During Drosophila development, the neurons are generated during the larval stages of development, and they arise from neural stem cells that are called neuroblasts. And these neuroblasts divide asymmetrically into a large and a small daughter cell. And after division, the small daughter cell will divide once more into two terminally differentiating neurons, whereas the large daughter cell will continue to divide asymmetrically in a stem cell-like fashion. So asymmetric cell division happens during the development of many brains. And if you think about it, there's actually three different ways of how cells could divide asymmetrically. Either a cell could generate just a bunch of daughter cells, where then some of them stochastically assume fate A, whereas others assume fate B. Alternatively, the process can be a bit more um, coordinated. For example, if the mother cell is under the control of a polarized environment and depends on certain factors that are secreted from there, but after division, only one of the two daughter cells continues to receive those factors and assumes fate A, whereas the other cells assume fate B. And in its most sophisticated way, asymmetric cell division can involve the polarized segre segregation of cell fate determinants into one of the two daughter cells, which then initiate a particular developmental pathway in this cell, but not in its sister cell. And it's this way of intrinsically asymmetric cell division that I would like to talk with you about today. So asymmetrically segregating determinants are not really all that a new idea. Already at the end of the 19th century, a developmental biologist called Weissman formulated what is now thought to be the first theory of a developmental cell fate specification. And what Weissman thought was that cells contain a set of nuclear determinants, which are then distributed during division among the daughter cells, so that at the end of development, each cell has one of these determinants, and this is what specifies their fates. Weissmann's theory was very successful because a few years later, a developmental biologist named Ed Conklin found the molecular equivalent of the segregating determinant. Conklin studied the development of ascidian eggs, and he found that Ascidian eggs contain a region of yellow cytoplasm that he called the yellow crescent. And what he found was that this yellow pigmented area during development always segregates with a particular cell lineage and in the end ends up in the muscles. And so he thought that the yellow crescent contains a substance that specifies muscle fate. Now, although the protein that is responsible for this has been identified, and although it is really a muscle fate 
determinant, uh, this pathway turned out not to be concerned in evolution and not really tell us about how asymmetric cell division uh, actually works. But this changed when uh, in the lab of um, Yunang Jan, Tadashi Urimura identified a gene that is called NUM. And NUM is the very first asymmetrically segregating determinant that was identified. NUM was originally identified as a drosophila mutant that affects the development of the so-called external sensory organs. Now, every one of you knows that the back of a fly is full with these hairs, and these hairs are uh, not just cuticular structures, but they're actually sensory organs. On, and each of these hairs contains four cells. It contains a hair cell, a socket cell, and then two internal cells that form a neuron and a sheath cell that surrounds the neuron. External sensory organs are a wonderful system to study asymmetric cell division because all the different cells in an external sensory organ are generated from one sensory organ precursor cell in a series of asymmetric cell divisions. So the SOP cell will first divide into two intermediate progenitors, which then generate neuron and sheath and hair and socket. Normally, all these divisions are asymmetric, but in a numb mutant, all of these divisions become symmetric so that all of the daughter cells in the end become socket cells. And conversely, when NUMP is overexpressed, the opposite cell fate transformation is observed and four neurons are formed. So the levels of NUMP seem to be responsible for specifying cell fates in external sensory organs. How this works was found by Michelle Ryu in the lab of Inang Jen a couple of years later. Because what she found was that NUMB encodes for a protein that localizes asymmetrically and segregates into one of the two daughter cells during mitosis. This movie shows you the segregation of NUMB during mitosis. So initially, NUMB, which is shown in green here, is uniformly distributed around the circumference of the cell. But as the cell goes into mitosis, you will see that NUMB accumulates on one side of the cell cortex, then the mitotic spindle orients, the sister chromatids separate, and the protein is specifically segregated into only one of the two daughter cells. So from this, it was thought that the asymmetric segregation of NUMB specifies the sister cell fates in the external sensory organ lineage. And it was later shown that in other lineages, like muscle lineages or the central nervous system, NUMB actually has a very similar function. So when I saw this subcellular localization for the first time when I was a graduate student, I was truly blown away by this. And so I applied as a postdoc to the lab of Inang Jan and wrote a proposal where I said, hey, I'm going to do a few experiments to, un to, to uncover the mechanism of asymmetric numb uh, segregation. I failed miserably, but I did find a few things about numb localization, and these are shown here. The first things we did was we simply analyzed the localization of NUMB and its relation to other cellular compartments. And what we found was that in interface, NUMB is uniformly distributed around the circumference of the cell, but the localization is specific to mitosis and that NUMB always localizes over one of the two spindle poles. So we thought there must be a connection between spindle orientation and NUMB localization. However, when we disrupted the mitotic spindle, NUMB was still asymmetrically localized. And conversely, in a NUMB mutant, the mitotic spindle still orients perfectly fine. And so we came up with this conceptual model for how asymmetric cell division could actually be um, coordinated. We thought there must be an axis of polarity that forms um, before a cell wants to undergo an asymmetric cell division. And then in mitosis, this axis of polarity is used for two independent cellular events. It's used to orient the mitotic spindle, and it is used to localize cell fate determinants asymmetrically. And together, the coordinated activity of those two events will lead to the establishment of two different cell fates in the two daughter cells. So this is an interesting conceptual model, but what are the molecules behind uh, this uh, uh, molecular machinery? The first molecular entry point 
into the machinery of asymmetric cell division came from the discovery of a molecule that is called inscutable. Inscutable is interesting because of its expression pattern. So this slide shows you an early Drosophila embryo, and inscutable is shown in blue, and you can see that it's specifically expressed in this region in the head. Now what is special about this region becomes clear if we look at this beautiful map of uh, the pattern of mitosis during Drosophila embryogenesis that was generated by Victoria Foe. The inscutable expression area corresponds to what Victoria Foe called domain 9. And domain 9 is special in the orientation of um, its division pattern. While all other domains divide symmetrically with a mitotic spindle that is oriented parallel to the surface of the epithelium, domain 9 reorients its mitotic spindle. The mitotic spindle assumes an apical basal orientation, and the cells divide asymmetrically to generate the very first neurons that are formed during Drosophila development. So the expression of inscutable correlates with asymmetric cell division and with vertical spindle orientation. And this um, is interesting, and so together with Rachel Kraut in the lab of Bill Chia, who actually identified inscutable, we set out to analyze its mutant phenotype. And this is summarized here. Normally, domain 9 divides with a vertical mitotic spindle. So this shows you a top view onto the epidermis of a Drosophila embryo, and you can see in those uh, 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 mitotic spindles that uh, the centrosome is pointing up and the microtubules are going towards the inside of the embryo. In an inscutable mutant, however, this is different. Now the mitotic spindles are all parallel to the surface. So inscutable is required for the reorientation of the mitotic spindle in mitotic domain 9. But inscutable is not only required, it's also sufficient for a spindle reorientation. This slide uh, this uh, image shows you mitotic spindles outside domain 9, and what you can see is that they're all parallel to the surface. But if we ectopically express the inscutable gene in this area, now these mitotic spindles reorient into an apical basal direction. Um, so inscutable is not only required, it is also sufficient for introducing an apical basal mitotic spindle orientation. So, Inscutable provided a molecular entry point into identifying the machinery for asymmetric cell division. And so we started to search for its binding partners. And uh, we found one key binding partner, which is illustrated on this slide. Um, we did this through biochemistry, um, and uh, we did a domain analysis of the inscutable protein and expressed several fragments, some of which retain the functions and others uh, do not retain the function. And then we pulled in the tag uh, with which those uh, transgenes were uh, tagged and found that the functional but not the non-functional form brought down two protein bands, one around 40 kilodalton and one to around 70 kilodalton. So we then used mass spectrometry to identify the uh, molecular identity of those protein bands and found that the 40 kilodalton band corresponds to a heterotrimeric G protein alpha subunit, whereas the 70 kilodalton band was a protein uh, that was called partner of inscutable or pins. And this protein was independently identified in the laboratory of uh, Bill Chia in a two-hybrid screen for inscutable binding proteins. And the function of these proteins is shown on the next slide. It turns out that PINS acts as a receptor-independent activator of heterotrimeric uh, G proteins. Now, PINS belongs to a family of proteins that are characterized by a so-called geolocal domain. Heterotrimeric G proteins normally are activated when ligands bind to a 7-transmembrane receptor. This leads to the exchange of GDP for GTP, the dissociation of the beta-gamma subunit, and then either the GTP-bound alpha subunit or the free beta-gamma subunit can transduce a signal. In the presence of PINs or its mammalian homologue uh, uh, AGS, however, without any nucleotide exchange, the beta-gamma subunit is separated and uh, the G proteins are activated. So pins 
um, and, in, uh, and the heterotrimeric G protein alpha subunits are functional binding partners of inscutable. And the mutant analysis showed that both of them are required for inscutable to perform its activity during asymmetric cell division. So how can those three proteins act together to orient mitotic spindles? A hint as to, as to how this could work came from the identification of yet another binding partner, which is called MAD in Drosophila, or NUMA in mammals. NUMA and MAD are microtubule binding proteins that are also part of the inscutable PINS G-alpha protein complex. And the way we think they act is that normally, MAD and NUMA are on the lateral side of an epithelial cell, and this leads to a horizontal orientation of the mitotic spindle. But when inscutable is expressed, now MAD and P, uh, PINS and G-alpha are recruited to the apical cell cortex. This generates a microtubule attachment site on the apical cell cortex and lead, leads to an apical basal uh, mitotic spindle orientation. So taken together, inscutable pins G-alpha and MADNUMA provide a microtubule attachment site that is sufficient to uh, orient the mitotic spindle in a particular direction. So how does inscutable know where to localize? Why is it localizing on the apical side and not on the basal side? A hint as to how this could happen came from a comparison of uh, other model systems that are also modeling asymmetric cell division. And one of the most famous model systems for asymmetric cell division is the warm C. elegans. Beautiful work from the laboratory of Tom Tony Hyman has actually shown that during early C. elegans development, the mitotic spindle is pulled towards the posterior side of the zygote, and this leads to an unequal cleavage into a small posterior and a larger anterior cell. And work from the laboratory of um, Ken Kempfuse has used this as a screening tool and identified a set of proteins that are commonly referred to as the PAR proteins. These PAR proteins, PAR1, PAR2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, occupy opposite domains on the early uh, C. elegans embryo, and in their absence, both mitotic spindle and cell fate become equal. Evolutionary considerations have shown that the PAR proteins are essentially involved in almost any event that involves cell polarization. And this goes from asymmetric cell division to epithelial polarity to uh, the, distinct, uh, the distinction between axons and uh, dendrites uh, and many other, the polarization of an oocyte and many other uh, polarity events. And they're also involved in asymmetric cell division. The PAR proteins are conserved in evolution, and the most important PAR proteins are PAR3, or bazooka in Drosophila, PAR6, and an atypical protein kinase C called APKC. And these three proteins form an evolutionary conserved protein complex. In Drosophila, this protein complex is always located at the apical side um, of epithelial cells and of asymmetrically dividing cells. In the absence of inscutable, however, the PAR proteins are not linked to the spindle orientation PINS G alpha MAD complex. And so the PAR proteins are on the apical side, the spindle orientation complex is on the lateral side, and for this reason, mitotic spindles are horizontal and the cells do not divide asymmetrically. When we turn on inscutable, however, Inscutable binds to the PAR protein complex. It goes to the apical cell cortex. It will recruit PINS G alpha MAD to the apical cortex. And this will lead to a reorientation of the mitotic spindle into an apical basal direction. So the PAR proteins determine the asymmetric localization of um, inscutable. So from this, we have a pretty good molecular understanding of the orientation of mitotic um, spindles. But how do the determinants segregate asymmetrically? A hint as to how this could happen came from beautiful work uh, that was done in the laboratory of uh, Francois Schweissgut, who showed that one of the PAR proteins 
the atypical protein kinase C can phosphorylate the NUMP protein. NUMP is recruited to the plasma membrane through a set of positively charged amino acids at its end terminus. And what APKC will do is it will phosphorylate the NUMP protein at this end terminus. This will neutralize the charges and the NUMP protein will form, fall into the uh, cytoplasm. So uh, during interphase, the NUMP protein is uniformly distributed around the circumference uh, of a cell. And this is because APKC does not phosphorylate NUMP. In order for APKC to phosphorylate NUMP, uh, a kinase, a mitotic kinase called Aurora A needs to become uh, active. It will phosphorylate the PAR6 subunit of the uh, PAR protein complex. Um, and this will trigger APKC to phosphorylate NUMB. And as APKC is only present on the apical side, NUMB will be phosphorylated on the apical side. On the apical side, it will fall off the uh, cell cortex. And for this reason, it will be concentrated on the basal side. So asymmetric phosphorylation of NUMB is the principle of its asymmetric localization. So with this, we have assigned molecules to each and every step of the asymmetric cell division uh, machinery. I told you that polarity in cells before mitosis is set up by the asymmetric localization of the PAR proteins to the apical side um, of the predivisional cell. As the cell goes into mitosis, the PAR proteins will then recruit uh, via the adapter protein in suitable pins, G alpha, and MAD to the apical side, and this will direct the orientation of the mitotic spindle. At the same time, the kinase APKC in the PAR protein complex, which will phosphorylate NUMB on one side, but not on the other side of the cell. And this will introduce its asymmetric localization. And together, these events lead to the asymmetric segregation of the NUMB protein into only one of the two daughter cells. So with this, we have been able to assign molecules to each and every step of this postulative mechanism for asymmetric cell division. More recently, however, there have been some modifications of this model. For example, it is now known that um, there is a second spindle orientation complex, which is called the telophase rescue pathway that involves a kinesin and the protein discs large that acts redundantly with inscutable pins uh, G alpha. And we also know uh, that the crystal structure of inscutable suggests that there is a complex exchange between these proteins during microtubule cortical attachment. But by and large, uh, this model explains how cells uh, divide asymmetrically. Now, the key question, of course, is how much of this is actually conserved when we move from Drosophila to vertebrates? Let me remind you again that um, in the mammalian cortex, the progenitor cells initially divide symmetrically to generate more progenitors, and only later they assume an asymmetric division mode where they generate one progenitor uh, and one neuron, or one progenitor and one intermediate progenitor, which then will generate two neurons. Now, as it turns out, the orientation of these divisions is slightly different. While the early symmetric divisions occur with a mitotic spindle that's precisely parallel to the ventricular surface. These later asymmetric divisions occur with a mitotic spindle that is slightly tilted. And so early hypotheses for how asymmetric cell division could be uh, guided assumed that because the mitotic spindle is no longer horizontally oriented, this would lead to an asymmetric distribution of cell fate determinants and would trigger um, asymmetric cell division. However, beautiful work, particularly from the lab of Fumio Matsuzaki, um, has shown that the number of cells that have an oblique mitotic spindle is far too low to explain the high fraction of asymmetric cell division. And to put this to a final test, my lab has generated a knockout mouse um, that contains a mutation uh, in the single homologue of the inscutable gene. And the phenotype that we saw um, is shown here. Normally, during the late stages um, of development, mitotic spindles are um, oblique. But when we knock out inscutable, as expected, now all the mitotic spindles become flat. But instead of a reversion of asymmetric 
to more symmetric divisions, we saw a different phenotype, and this is illustrated here. In a normal mouse, the progenitor cells can undergo either direct or indirect neurogenesis. During indirect neurogenesis, the intermediate progenitors will generate two differentiating neurons. But what you see when you turn the mitotic spindle and make it more flat is a bias towards direct neurogenesis. So unlike in Drosophila, where inscrutable decides between symmetric and asymmetric cell division, in the mouse it decides between direct or indirect neurogenesis. But the most interesting aspect of the inscrutable phenotype comes from an overexpression experiment, and this is illustrated here. So we also generated a mouse that we can use to overexpress the inscrutable gene in the developing mouse um, cortex. And what we then find is that the number of neurons that are generated is vastly um, exceeded. So there's many more neurons that are generated. And this is through a mechanism that is very interesting from an evolutionary point of view and is illustrated here. The overexpression of inscrutable leads to a vast enhancement of oblique or even vertical mitotic spindles. And as a result, some of the daughter cells no longer reside in the ventricular zone. Instead, they become progenitor cells, which now reside outside the um, uh, uh, ventricular zone. And such progenitor cells are called outer radial glia cells or by other labs, basal radial glia cells. Normally, this type of progenitors does not occur in the mouse or only in very low numbers. Instead, outer radial glia or basal radial glia cells are typical for the primate cortex. And this is shown here. So in rodents, the cortex contains the ventricular zone. There's an area that is called the subventricular zone, which contains the intermediate progenitors, and then there is the cortical plate. But in the human cortex, there is an additional layer, which is called the outer subventricular zone. And this layer contains a cell type that is called the outer radial glia cells. And these outer radial glia cells act as a transit amplifying population. So in mice, per progenitor division, either one neuron or two neurons are generated, but in humans, uh, the progenitors can generate these outer radial glia cells, which then continue to divide asymmetrically, generating hundreds of intermediate progenitors and hundreds of neurons. Now, this is good news because it explains why we have so many more neurons uh, than rodents, but it's also bad news because it means that we can no longer use the mouse as a model system to study this uh, uh, aspect of asymmetric cell division. And of course, the inscrutable overexpression phenotype suggests a very provocative possibility, which would be that enhanced levels of inscrutable would be responsible in part by generating, for generating these um, um, outer radial glia cells. Now, in order to do, to test this hypothesis, we would actually have to remove inscrutable from a human brain. But of course, this experiment is not possible. So how can we address the development of a cortex in a human or a primate um, setting. In order to do so, my lab has more recently generated three-dimensional culture methods, which we now can use to model human cortical development in the lab. So this is one example of what we call a cerebral organoid. There is a cortical tissue here. Here you actually see the development of a human eye. Here is another example. Um, this is cortical tissue. You can see the development of a ventricular zone here. Here is a lateral ventricle. And here uh, you see differentiating neurons which are beginning to form a cortical plate. Here's other areas of the human brain um, that uh, form uh, uh, different uh, uh, brain regions and that have slightly different morphologies. And we can generate these organoids from um, pluripotent stem cells that we can generate from essentially any a patient either healthy or suffering from a neurodevelopmental disorders. And we've already used them to model some of the major, uh, some, of, some of the more severe neurodevelopmental um, um, disorders like microcephaly. Um, and uh, we can now use them to actually analyze uh, brain development and the role of asymmetric cell division um, in humans. And in the second lecture, I will tell you more about 
how we generate these organoids and about the results that we have um, obtained with them. So in the end, I would just like to summarize um, that I've shown you that asymmetric cell division can occur through the asymmetric segregation of protein determinants. I've also shown you that inscutable is a molecular trigger for the orientation of the mitotic spindle. Uh, I've shown you that inscutable acts by binding to its interaction partner pins, uh, and with that, through a heterotrimeric G protein alpha subunit. I've shown you that the PAR proteins are important for setting up the axis of polarity during asymmetric cell division. Uh, and finally, I've shown you that inscutable regulates spindle orientation in the mouse cortex, but in the mouse, this only regulates the balance between direct and indirect um, neurogenesis. And finally, I've shown you that the human cortex contains progenitors that you do not, or only in very small numbers, find in rodents, but that we can generate organoids from human pluripotent stem cells that we can use to study human cortical development um, in cell culture. So in the end, I would just like to acknowledge people who actually contributed to this. I would like to thank all the members of my lab, uh, whether in past or uh, present, who have contributed uh, to these various results that elucidate mechanisms of asymmetric cell division. Um, I mentioned particularly the work of Matthias Schäfer, who uh, identified pins and G-alpha, uh, Markus Schober, who found the role of the PAR proteins, Mark Petronsky, who found uh, the role of uh, PAR6, Sarah Baumann found uh, the MAD protein, and Frederick Wirtzpeitz and uh, Takashi Nishimura uh, identified the mechanism for numb localization. The inscutable knockout was generated by Maria Pia uh, Postiglione, and uh, the cerebral organoids were generated by Madeleine uh, Lancaster. I would like to thank the uh, Austrian Academy of Sciences, the European Research Council, the Austrian Research Fund, and EMBO for funding my research, and my entire lab for being a great group that is uh, fun to work with.